representation really has two aspects. And one is uh, what's often called the vehicle, the physical thing, like the physical map, the, the sounds that I'm uttering now, written text on the page. And what makes those things, those physical things, representations is that they carry information about something, uh, something outside themselves. So a representation then has these two aspects. It's a physical thing. It's physically realized. That's the vehicle. And the vehicle carries a message, uh, information about some sort. And we call that meaning or, or content. So, so far, that's just about public representation. So mental representation um, is the idea that something like, something kind of similar in relevant respects is going on in the brain. So what that means is there's got to be some kind of vehicle, some kind of physically realized thing. Maybe it's a sequence of symbols. Maybe it's something that we can't even imagine. But it's a physical thing that can, that, that can play a causal role in our thinking and in our behavior and so on. And moreover, that physical thing carries, some, carries information. And that's what we call the content of the representation. Hello, my geeselings. This is Mother Goose, Robinson Earhart, here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast, number 86. And this episode is with Frankie Egan, who is Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at Rutgers, where she works on the philosophy of mind, the philosophy of psychology, and the foundations of cognitive science, along with a bunch of other adjacent topics. But Recently, Frankie's been researching computational models of cognition and how they relate to representation. And I think that if you toss in a psychological explanation, uh, a bit about the mind's boundaries and how the mind interfaces with our bodies and the world, then you've got a pretty good summary of the content we cover in this discussion. But there is some, I mean, if, as if that, the dog's shaking out his ears, as if that weren't a mouthful, I think that some background information might be really useful, uh, just about psychological explanation and then representation in general. And there are different levels of psych psychological explanation or different ways in which we explain the way that people think or how their brains work. For instance, we might reason about people with what's referred to in the philosophical parlance as folk psychology, which is a, a pre-scientific, uh, pre-theoretical modality. Uh, you might also talk about folk physics, for instance, how we just, before science, based on our intuitive understanding the world that we live in, how we see physics. But the way that we reason about psychology as folk revolves around what what are called propositional attitudes. And a propositional attitude is a mental state or an attitude that is related to a proposition and that is in a very uh, explanatory, uh, that doesn't sound like the right word. That isn't a very helpful explanation. It just sounds redundant. But anyway, it contains some sort of propositional content. So I want to eat ice cream, which we might, I mean, take that as a phrase. I want to eat as a sentence or a proposition, a sentence. I want to eat ice cream. And we might paraphrase this as, Robinson desires that. So that's my attitude. And then the proposition, Robinson will eat ice cream, or I'm afraid of starvation, or I'd hate to go to bed hungry. And you might explain my observed behavior of going to the fridge for ice cream by referencing one of the propositional attitudes I just mentioned. And that's what I mean when I say that uh, we are engaged in psychological explanation by referencing uh, propositional attitudes. But this is just one way in which, or one level at which you can explain somebody's psychology, because you can also explain my behavior of going to 
the uh, fridge by referencing neurological mechanisms or the the motion of quarks and protons in my brain, though that wouldn't be particularly helpful, or in representational terms. And this is this is what I mean when we when I say that we discuss psychological explanation. But I should also then say a bit about mental representations. And this is actually a pretty vexed and confusing subject, I think. And it's what we spend most of the conversation exploring. But a representation is really just something that carries content or conveys information in the sense that the sounds uh, coming out of my mouth are a vehicle to use Frankie's Uh, terminology that she uses in the episode for conveying information to you. And the question of mental representation then is what the structures are in the brain that represent, or if there are any, um, how they do this. For some useful background information, you might want to check out an article on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy called Mental Representation, and that's by David Pitt. And you should also check out Frankie's website, which is francis-egan.org. The last thing I should say is comments, subscribes, all of those things are likes. They're always so helpful. And I also have that channel on Twitch and YouTube, Robinson Eats, where I eat a pint of ice cream or, or something else, and I do this. Pretty much every morning, though I'm not sure how much longer I'll be doing it in the morning, but I'm going to continue doing it every day. And now, without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. Frankie, as far as I could tell from your publication record, You've always been working in the philosophy of mind, and I saw that you you got a a master's in philosophy, a a PhD in philosophy. Even when you were an undergraduate, were you already focused on the philosophy of mind, or did that come a bit later? Um, I guess I've always been interested in philosophy of mind, but um, I have, uh, I think, a a really an earlier interest in uh, in, in philosophy of science. So I've come to kind of philosophy of mind from a philosophy of science background, although questions about how the mind works, how it's related to the body and so on have always interested me. But, but my focus has really been more from philosophy of science. My, my undergraduate teachers were Pat and Paul Churchland. Uh, and they, oh, uh, they wonderful. Both of them, yeah, both of them studied under, uh, under Wilfred Sellers at, uh, at, at the University of Pittsburgh, so I kind of got that uh, that that that's that's kind of my earliest background. Um, I I learned yeah. an awful lot from them. They're eliminativists about the mind. I mean, they have pretty radical views. Right. Uh, I don't share most of those views, but I do really share uh, an interest in trying to in in approaching issues in the philosophy of mind from a philosophy of science perspective. Mm-hmm. Pat was on the podcast a few months ago, and it was it was really wonderful talking to her. But I can imagine how having them as professors would really uh, suck you into the philosophy. Yeah, of mind, they're, the philosophy of they're incredibly passionate. They're, they're really they're great teachers. Yeah, mm-hmm. I learned a lot and it was mm-hmm. a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Something that I was wondering as I was looking over your work is... You're so interested in psychological explanation, uh, representation, theories of cognition, and even vision and perception. And this led me to wonder why it was that, in particular, philosophy seemed like the appropriate track through academia to research these topics, rather than, say, psychology or neuroscience or cognitive science or something like that something else like that. What was it about philosophy that engaged you more uh, for these topics? Um, I think, I mean, of course, I still, uh, I, I read a, a lot in psychology and neuroscience and in, mm. in philosophy, in, in science generally. Um, I think it was, 
uh, it, it was the the focus on foundational issues uh, and not so much on the on the details. Uh, so I think that uh, in general, philosophers who work in 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 the various kind of uh, empirically oriented uh, branches of philosophy have come to it from an interest in the in 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 that empirical domain, but an interest in really the foundations of what's going on in the science, and um, at least in early stages of studying those sciences, you're not really you're not really free to question the assumptions and the and the foundations of the of the discipline. So that was why I I mean I, I was interested in I have a general interest in philosophy. I came to um, philosophy initially as a as a freshman. Uh, motivated by by an interest in political philosophy and philosophy of religion, uh, and then just the, the the world of philosophy kind of opened up to me as I as I took more courses as an undergraduate. Hmm. When you say the the foundations of the science, the first thing that comes to my mind is foundations of mathematics, which I think of as this whole constellation of questions surrounding maybe epistemology, uh, metaphysics, so like the security of our knowledge about mathematics, uh, what the objects of mathematics are. What do you have in mind when you refer to like the foundations of the sciences of, of cognitive science of neuroscience or psychology? What are the sorts of questions there? Yeah, so the, uh, one particular uh, interest that I have uh, is the role that uh, representation plays in psychology, in uh, in neuroscience. So a, a whole a complex of foundational issues would be concepts that we encounter in everyday life, in uh, in uh, in other branches of philosophy, and just in generally in kind of our intellectual endeavors, and the role that those uh, that those concepts play in the actual science. So that's kind of what I think of mainly as foundation, uh, as sort of, I mean, that's, that's certainly an important kind of foundational issue across the sciences. So for example, in biology, it might be how are species, how's the notion of species understood in, uh, in, in evolutionary theory and in biology generally? How's the, what, how, how's the notion of gene to be understood? How's the notion of population to be understood? And similar sorts of questions for psychology um, and neuroscience. Hmm. Well, you, you mentioned I mean, representation. I think, sorry. I was just going to say oh, no, that you, you working know. scientists very often don't, um, they don't discuss these foundational issues. But if you're coming to it uh, from an interest in, it, it, it may, maybe in more general issues, that, then, then those are questions that are going, going to occur to you. How are the theorists actually using the notion of species or or um, or representation or concept or and so on. Yeah, and so you mentioned representation a, a few times now, and that's as you know exactly what I wanted to talk about. And there there are different sorts of representations, but particularly I wanted to talk about mental representations. And and I would ask you what they are, but that's exactly what's up for debate. So I, I suppose that what I ought to do is ask you something along the lines of how, in a loose, uh, bare bone sense, for my audience that isn't familiar with talk of mental representations, how people think of them without sort of getting into the nitty gritty yet of their purpose or their reality or whether they're they're figurative in some sense so maybe what the the textbook idea of a men mental representation yeah good so the, so let's start with um with the, the general notion of representation uh it has its home in kind of public in in the domain of public representation so there's maps there's written written text um i can represent i can tell you about what i did yesterday so th that's kind of the standard basic uh, application of the notion of representation. It's part of our public lives. And Those... the idea is that like a map, what, what makes it a representation, uh, just to clarify, to make sure we're on the same page, is that uh, 
the map or the words that we used to say about what you did yesterday, they carry some sort of content that isn't really located maybe in the, in the symbols or the, like the drawings themselves. Yes, exactly. Good. Okay. So a representation right. really has two aspects. And one is uh, what's often called the vehicle, the physical thing, like the physical map, the, the sounds that I'm uttering now, written text on the page. And what makes those things, those physical things, representations, is that they carry information about something, uh, something outside themselves. So a representation then has these two aspects. It's a physical thing. It's physically realized. That's the vehicle. And the vehicle carries a message, uh, information about some sort. And we call that meaning or, or content. So, so far, that's just about public representation. So mental representation um, is the idea that something like, something kind of similar in relevant respects is going on in the brain. So what that means is there's got to be some kind of vehicle, some kind of physically realized thing. Maybe it's a sequence of symbols. Maybe it's something that we can't even imagine. But it's a physical thing that can, that, that can play a causal role in our thinking and in our behavior and so on. And moreover, that physical thing carries, some, carries information. And that's what we call the content of the representation. Now, okay. um, I mean, one interesting question is the lots of people work on how we, how public representations get their, get their meaning or content. The philosophers of language focus on that. An interesting question. It's, it's in, it's in terms of some kind of convention or agreement among the users. So that can't be the answer to how mental representations get their meaning. Um, they have to get their meaning in, in some other way. And that's the so-called problem of intentionality. Mm -hmm. Now, just so that we have more of a, a concrete example to work with, how is representational language used in cognitive science? So I know you've worked a lot, for instance, on, on vision and the history of theories of vision. So maybe an example here uh, might help us see a bit more of what's at stake when we use representation talk in uh, a more realistic setting. Okay, good. I mean, that's a source of a lot of controversy. So the kind of standard view on that is that um, is what, what I might call kind of robust realism robust representational realism. And that's the idea that in uh, the uh, theories of vision, for example, posits structures in the head. So that's the vehicle that causes subsequent processing and ultimately behavior. And those structures uh, have content and how do they get, so they mean something and they typically mean something about, they have meaning with respect to something that's going on outside the organism. And in having content, in representing something outside themselves, there's a substantive relation uh, holding between the thing in the head, the vehicle in the head, and what it's about, its meaning or content. It's the thing in the world. So maybe um, there's a structure in the head. A, a theory of vision um, might posit structure in the head um, that means edge in the world. And representational realists think that there's, there's really, there's some independently specifiable substantive relation between what's in here and, and edges in the world in virtue of which what's in here means edge. So that's real, that's robust realism about representations. Other uh, theorists of, uh, of, of, of computational or cognitive science have various kind of anti-realist positions on representation. So one, one position is fi fictionalism, for example, uh, which is the idea that there aren't really these structures in the head, but it's useful to talk about them for various purposes. And then, uh, I mean, that's one anti-realist position. There's other kinds of anti-realist positions as well. Can we talk a bit more about the robust realist first before we 
move on to some of the elementivist positions? Sure. Sure. So when you say that there are structures in the head, so there, there's the vehicle and there's the meaning as you, or the content, as you put it earlier. And the vehicle, using the, the vision example, I'm guessing that the vehicle is just the substrate of the brain. I mean, the, uh, the neurons. Is that roughly what the vehicle is supposed to is supposed to be? Well, the um, the vehicle is is a structure typically that's realized in neural matter. How it might be realized is an open question. Different uh, different theories. I mean, so there's there are big questions about how these structures that are posited are are realized. Are they properties of neural networks? Are they properties of individual neurons. So that's a big issue. But the vehicle is generally understood to be a more, more abstract than, 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 than just neurons or even populations of neurons. So it might be, um, for example, a typical okay. I see. process of activation. The, the vehicles are, are at a level of abstraction above, the ner- the, the, above neurons and neural substrates. So Just like, for example, a, in, in a written language, you might, the letter A, for example, there's different ways that it might be realized in even just taking handwriting or, or tech, you know, typed um, type symbols. Mm-hmm. We can we can generalize over uh, a, a whole uh, a whole diff- a whole range of physical things. We're abstracting away from certain physical properties. And so that's the way to understand the vehicles. They might be symbols. They might be something something else so to use uh, the computer analogy the vehicle isn't the actual physical hardware it's the software that is run on on the hardware and it can be realized in different medium media no the vehicle is a physical thing but it's an it's an abstraction over different particular. So for example, um, it might be that neuron, let's, let's stick with neurons. It might be that neurons firing at a particular rate in, a, in various regions of the brain count as a particular kind of vehicle. So the vehicle isn't necessarily okay. this particular neuron with this particular, with these particular neural properties. It might be, uh, it might be, uh, it, it, in, instantiated in different ways in the in the neurons, but it, what's important is the vehicles. They're not the software. They are causally efficacious properties of, of of the brain. So their vehicles are causes. They're just not. Uh, they're they're just they're abstractions off particular. All of the physical details are not necessarily relevant to a particular vehicle's type identity as that type of vehicle. So just like for, I think it's it, it's useful to think of letters. The letters might be, you're, you're writing something, you could be using blue ink, you could be using red ink, you could be writing in caps, writing in uh, in, in small letters. Um, you could be, it could be cursive, it could be printing. All of those things are, are different ways of, in, of realizing or instantiating, say the letter A. Now, the vehicles are that population or that group grouping of uh, different kinds of physical things as a, a symbol or a vehicle uh, abstracts away from a lot of physical detail. But what it gets you is, mm-hmm. is, a, is a type of thing that's, that has causal powers. That's crucial. And so there is a vision then posit these structures that play causal roles in in perceptual processing. So perceptual process processes run off those those vehicles. So it's definitely it's it's not it's not software. It's 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 hardware considered at a at a level of abstraction that doesn't necessarily require but that, uh, focusing on particular aspects of the of the neural realization. Mm-hmm. And the other question that I had about the realist position is just what this, uh, 
the quote unquote substantive relation between the vehicle and the thing it represents is supposed to be is it just like a a causal relationship or something more abstract even than that um that's a great question so that's where a lot of the controversy is so um that's where different theories of of content come into play so information theoretic or we could call them causal theories um, of content say that it is a causal relation uh, between what's between the tokening of the vehicle, between the, the, the structure you know occurring in my head and what it's about, that it's based on a causal relation. Now there, that, that, that's a little bit too simple, but that's kind of the, the basic idea. Then um, teleosemantic theories, theorists, claim that it's not necessarily a causal, that that's not the relation that grounds representation. It's rather some kind of functional relationship. So, for example, uh, Ruth Millikan and other teleosemanticists claim that a structure in the head gets its meaning from the function that that structure played in the evolutionary history of the organism. Now, there are obviously going to be causal elements in that story, but the the the, the the, the uh, content of the structure is determined by its role, say its causal role back in the period when it was stabilized, but that process was stabilized by evolution. So those are two very different accounts of what the substantive relation underlying the representation relation is. And there are other, there are other possibilities too. The next thing okay. that I was going to ask is you mentioned the eliminativist views as well, in which, I mean, w well, one version of them is they take representation talk as somehow analogous to uh, fiction talk. So representations are useful fictions. But right. I wonder, I mean, when I, when I, what I'm supposed to make of then me seeing you right now, because obviously what's happening in my head, something's happening in my head. I mean, I'm seeing you. Uh, this, I'm not. I don't know how to how to put this in technical language, but the you that I'm seeing isn't the you out there. It's it's all inside of my head. And what is this in my head if it isn't a representation? If this representation talk is fictional, why is this not just? like a verbal issue of what to call it. Okay, um, so the issue concerns how theories, uh, psychological theories, neuroscientific theories are to be understood. So kind of the, the, the realist interpretation is that the theory posits a structure uh, in the head and then it gets interpreted as saying, as being about edges in the world. So the, the fictionalist says that, no, uh, there's no, we're not really to take talk of representation as being, as, as we're not to interpret it realistically. We're not to think that there's really a structure in there that gets interpreted, that um, talking in terms of representations serves various useful functions, like maybe predicting how the how the organism is going to behave in certain circumstances, maybe systematizing um, various aspects of the theory. So it serves various pragmatic purposes, really. But we're not to be we're, we're not to really think that the theory is saying this is actually part of what's going on in the head. So it's a question of what are the actual ontological commitments of the of the theory, and the fictionalist says we shouldn't think that talk of representation is talk of, about anything real. It's just, it's just use, useful for certain purposes. So that's not to say that there are, it's not positing fictions in the head of the subject. Rather, it's saying, it, it's saying that when the theorist talks about representations, don't take that seriously. Don't think that that's saying anything uh, concrete about what's, what's going on in the head. Does, does that clarify it? So it, it's it's a question of theory interpretation. Yeah, it, it 
it does clarify it, but it still leaves me wondering then how the fictionalist or eliminativist would have you talk about the experience of you or the perception of you that I have in my head if we're not using this representational language. Is that a major obstacle for the fictionalist? Well, there's always a question about how what, what the connection is between uh, what the theory says about what the brain's doing and what your pers- what your experience is like when you're undergo when you're you're undergoing the process that the theory describes. So there's a question, for example, with respect to th- to theories in early vision, how that relates to the subject's visual experience. And I think you're asking a question. Uh, I think you're asking a question about the latter, and the fictionalist, and the and to some extent the eliminativist. They're they're somewhat different positions. Is is talking about what's going on in, in, in the theory. I'm not, I'm not sure that those, that there's a, a straightforward answer about how those two things hook up. So one, another, a different example would be um, some Bayesian theorists think that uh, construing what the brain is doing in terms of, of, of Bayesian processes gives us a nice way of systematizing and predicting how the, how, how the brain is going to behave, how, how the, how the, the how the processes are going to play out. But we shouldn't think that the brain is actually doing Bayesian calculations. We shouldn't take those, we shouldn't take that realistically. Shouldn't take that. Now, you know, that's, that's fine. I mean, some Bayesian theorists claim that they're just, that that's all they're doing. It's just a predictive and systematizing device. But of course, that doesn't, uh, if that's if that's what they're doing, then they're not offering explanations about what the brain's doing when it is able to execute certain uh, cognitive capacities or perceptual capacities. So to, to construe the theories as fictionalist is is to basically to say I'm not offering an explanation of what the brain is actually. Right. No. Doing. That this example with the Bayesians. Uh, makes this a lot makes it makes a lot of sense it clarifies a lot for me and moving on though in your is it jean nico i guess that would be the the french pronunciation but i think of uh, the jean nico lectures yeah, jean nico. Yeah. yeah you yeah jean have yeah. you propose and defend a third uh deflationary view about representations that is distinct from the robust realist and the eliminativist uh, position. But when I, when I hear the term deflationary in a philosophical context, I often think of fiction because they both ha- are the fictionalist because they both often have a certain connection to instrumentalism or pragmatics. And you, you use the word pragmatic in in conjunction with the fictionalist position. So I'm curious about how your deflationary account works and why it doesn't just end up treating representations as useful fictions. Okay, good. Yeah, the term deflationary can mean all kinds of different things in different domains. So let me try to spell out what I mean by it when I'm talking about mental representation. So, um, a def- the, a defl- my deflationary view of mental representation claims one that there isn't a substantive relation, robust substantive relation that holds between what's going on in the head and uh, and what the uh, that structure is about, what the representation is about. Say edge, you know, edge edge structure in here, structure in here, and edges in the world. No substantive uh, so, relation. So no causal relation. Between, uh, that. Oh, there's, there's lots of causal relations, sure. But there's no kind of, there's no over and above. There's, there's no, let, let me back up, back up a little bit. And, and put this in terms of the distinction between vehicle and content. A deflationary okay. view, because a deflationary view kind of, in a sense, splits the difference. It goes with, robust realists 
uh, with respect to the vehicle and claims that those things, a theory that has explanatory pretensions, that claims to actually explain the process, has got to posit causally efficacious structures that play a role in the processes. So it's realist about the vehicles and it's pragmatic or inst in a sense instrumentalist. I don't really like that way of putting it because that tends to uh, put us in mind of, you know, of, of just eliminativism and fictionalism. The idea though is that there's not, uh, there isn't some kind of naturalistic uh, relation that holds between the, th the thing in the head and the thing out there that it represents. A second uh, plank of uh, my deflationism is that content isn't an essential part of, of these structures of representations. So the mental states that get acquired, internal states that, that, that are attributed content in a model the, the content isn't an essential property of that state, whereby I, I, I mean this, if that's, that structure could have been given a different kind of content or maybe no content at all, and it could still be the same type of, uh, same type of mental state. So content isn't an essential property. Content can vary and it'll still, it'll still count as the same type of, of, of state. And the third, the third plank is, is that content gets attributed uh, for various pragmatic purposes. Content attribution is always pragmatically motivated. And so that kind of connects with the first, the denial that there is this substantive relation that has nothing to do with kind of the, any, any pragmatic elements, any purposes that might be served by positing that relation. So content's always pragmatically motivated. It, it's, it, it's, it's determined by, by, by various kinds of functions that it can serve uh, in the theory, functions in the theory, not functions for the organism. So remember I talked a few minutes ago about teleosemantic uh, theories of content. Teleosemanticists claim that it's the function, the function that that, uh, that that structure serves either maybe now or in the evolutionary past that determines its content. I'm claiming when I talk about prag pragmatic attribution of content, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm really talking about the purposes that attributing content to that internal state serves for consumers of the theory, for uh, people trying to understand what the theory is doing, students trying to learn uh, learn, learn the science, learn the theory, not uh, functions served by, for the organism itself. So that, that distinction is really important. Content serves various functions for, for, for the theorist and for consumers of the theory. And it's not its basis, it's not grounded in any kind of substantive relation between what's going on here and what's going on out there. So that, that that's what I mean by deflationism in the domain of mental representation. So it's realism about the vehicle, pragmatic about the, um, about the content. Okay. So it's to, to paraphrase, to make sure that I understand we, the content is still in a way, a uh, a useful fiction, but we're still a realist about what's going on in the brain. Um, yeah, I guess I, I guess that's an okay way to put it. Given that content is abstract, though, um, concrete content isn't concrete. Um, I'm not completely happy with describing it as as a fiction. Uh, because contents are, you know, they're, they're like numbers. Uh, well, I, I don't want to get into that issue, <laughs> but uh, the, the point is rather that uh, the justification for attributing content is purely by what it does for the theorist, for the consumer of the theory, not for the organism. Right. And that, that's, that's an important distinction. Right. But I, I, I don't think we should call it fiction. Uh, it's, you know, the, the theory might but, attribute certain content for certain purposes, and that's just the content that, 
that the theory is committed to. But when you say for the theory and the for the consumer, is this to stress though that the content is useful in explanation rather than in the processes going on in the organization? Yes. Okay, that's a, that's a better paraphrase. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Right. You... And like, let me just say one thing, though, just to underscore that the vehicle, uh, fully realist about the uh, about the vehicle, mm -hmm. assuming that the theory is being offered as an exp an explanation of what the brain's doing. Mm -hmm. Now you used the the word naturalistic earlier. And I want to hone in a bit on that now. What does it mean to say that, for instance, computational cognitive science is in the business of naturalizing uh, representation or other mental states? Yeah, I think in general, people mean different things by it, but I think in general, the idea is that computational cognitive science is in the business of explaining perceptual and cognitive processes without presupposing anything, anything intentional, anything semantic. Uh, it's trying to explain those, those kinds of processes, how we're able to mean things about the world. Uh, without presupposing anything in any semantic or intentional relation holding between what's in the head and what's out there. I think that's what mo that so so-called naturalistic semantics is the attempt to describe a relation between what's going on in the head, structures in the head, say, or states in the head, and what they're about in the world um, that doesn't make any reference to anything semantic or intentional, because that would be that would be in this context, uh, question begging. So naturalistic semanticists try to explicate what the grounding relation uh, of meaning or in, in intentional content is. Uh, it might be causal. It might be, as I said, kind of functional or teleological. It might be in terms of some kind of structural similarity between what's going on in here and what's referred to out there. But they, uh, it's not kosher to introduce anything semantic or intentional. So that's what so-called naturalistic semanticists have in mind when they, when they describe their, their project in those terms. And is the problem with the semantics or the intentional content for the naturalist or the naturalistic project that these items are abstract and not, not physical? No, um, the problem is that it looks like um, there seems to be too many content candidates, too many different um, relations or even, spec even specifying a single relation. That relation produces or yields multiple contents that are, that are in incompatible. So that's... That's the main problem. So you get indeterminacy of content. Suppose you're in, you, you claim, suppose the theory claims that it's uh, the causal relation is what establishes or grounds the meaning relation, the representation relation. Turns out that there are that cause it, the ca there's no the cause that delivers a single content candidate. The, the classic example of this is um, Letvin and, and collaborators frog fly case. Um, just very briefly. Please, uh, please. What does the, the, the frog, when a fly crosses its, its visual field, its tongue snaps out and, and catches it? What does, what does the internal state uh, that starts that process, what does it mean? When there are various, you know, just sticking to a causal relation, it might be, it might be fly, it might be, um, it might be food, um, it could be small, dark, moving thing. The thing that's crossing the visual field that engages the mechanism is all of those things. And those are different contents. 
So it, the problem is that the candidates for the, this naturalistic relation, this non-semantic and non-intentional relation, seem to yield up to get to too many incompatible contents. It can't mean all of those things. And why? Though you might have already said this, but maybe it just bears repeating for me. But why do philosophers in general believe that computational theories as they stand are not naturalistic in the sense that they, they use these intentional terms that are question begging? Um, yeah, I don't think that, that philosophers think that computational theories are not naturalistic. Oh, okay. Hmm. Um, the, yeah, so the, this, I think they think they are naturalistic, but, um, you might, you know, you might wonder if the, the object of study is computational theories and they're naturalistic, they, they're, they're specifying some non-intentional and non-semantic relation that grounds the, the, the meaning of the structures that they posit. You know, why isn't it easy to read off from the theories what that relation is? And I think the reason is that computational theorists aren't really assuming any kind of represent, substantive representation relation. They're ascribing content when they when they do when they do posit a, a structure and, and attribute content to it. Um, they're doing that for various pragmatic purposes. So they're not positing any kind of they're not non they're not non naturalistic in that in that they're positing some intentional or semantic relation that would be cheating because that's what they're supposed to be they're supposed to be explaining intentional processes. I think they're just the you can't, well, it's important, I think, and something that's been missed, well, there, I mean, it's a really, this is a really controversial area. So some theorists, many teleosemanticists think they're finding in the, in the science and looking carefully at the, at, the, at the various theories, they're finding empirical support for their theory of, of content. Um, they're, they're, they're different teleosemantic accounts of content. And you can find that there. You can find, um, for example, a neuroscientist saying that structure in the brain represents locations in the, in the, in the rat's visual field, for example. Uh, the, in the, the, a rat place cells in the rat's hippocampus fire when and only when the rat is focusing on a particular location. So, and, the, and, and neuroscientists then talk about it representing that. But that's, I, that's what I call a gloss on the causal process. They're not, uh, they're not positing any robust substantive representation relation. They're using representational talk um, because it serves various functions there. So with respect to the frog, I'm, I'm possibly getting a little bit ahead of myself, but why might a theorist say that the struck the frog's brain is representing food rather than fly or small dark moving thing well it might say that because um the the the, in, the 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 theorist is interested in explaining how what's going on in the frog's visual system contributes to the well-being of the frog so the theorist may may have the larger well-being of the frog uh in mind and the theorist's explanatory goal is to explain how what's going on there contributes to this bigger picture. Or the theorist might say that, might be inclined to say that that mechanism is representing fly. Why? I mean, why fly? Well, because that particular theorist may be, that, that might be an ethologist who's interested in explaining what's going on in the, in, in the frog's entire environmental niche. And so that theorist is concerned with how the various organisms in, the, in that environmental niche interact with each other. On, you know, on, on, the, third, on the third hand, mm -hmm. if the theorist is interested simply in explaining how the mechanism in the head works as uh, you know, strictly a neuroscientific, as it's a neuroscientist of, of frogs explaining the, that mechanism, then small dark moving thing is pretty close to 
characterizing the stimulus conditions for the, the firing of the, uh, of the internal structure. Mm -hmm. So notice three different content attributions, three different explanatory projects. And, and it's those explanatory projects or the goals or interests that the theorists have that drives them or that motivates them to attribute various content. So you don't sip typically see when you're reading, uh, reading accounts of the theories, those background interests and explanatory goals and projects that are motivating the, pro the project for the entire community, though that's background, that's shared background. It's not laid out explicitly um, in the introduction where the theorist doesn't say, I'm interested in specifying what, how the process works. And so if you, if you could see that, then you could see the, how the pragmatic considerations are driving content attribution. But that's not how theories are, are typically articulated. They're articulated with certain background assumptions kind of understood by the consumers of the theory. So it's that, that's the sense in which I'm saying that content attribution is typically for consumers of the theory and it's their ex shared explanatory goals and projects that are going to, that are going to motivate the, the choice of content when there's multiple candidates. Mm. So to, again, to make sure that I'm following and I think I am, I think things are coming together that this is again, an example of your deflationary approach at work in which the content is useful to the theorist because it allows them to better explain and understand what is going on in the frog when they uh, attribute or speak of this representation of the fly as a fly or as food or as uh, this small moving thing in particular different contexts. Right, right. So can I just make two, two sort of points Please. of clarification? One is that um, it's the explanatory target, the sort of project that the theorist is engaged in, that, I mean, that plays a role in motivating one content attribution over other possible ones. Um, there are other considerations too. So suppose that the theorist is trying to explicate, to explain how the, how the, the mechanism works then um, and the story is going to going to be based in the causal process from the fly crossing the visual field to uh, to what's happening in the brain that engages the the frog's tongue. That's a, a complex causal process. Um, one thing that's happening in that in that causal process is is patterns on the retina. So it's not just you know instantly fly food. Uh, small dark moving thing, those are all distal property instantiations. Those are all things that happen outside the frog and that initiates a causal chain and there's a proximal stimulus patterns on the retina. That's just as much part of the causal process. So why doesn't the internal uh, structures firing represent the patterns on the retina? Uh, just as much an essential part of the process. Well. Right, it's an essential part of the process, but what the content attribution does, one of its important kind of contributions to the whole account is it allows the theorist to single out what's salient for explanatory purposes in a causal process that's very complex. The, re the stuff that happens between the distal property tokening out there and the, in, the internal structure firing in here, all of that is an important part of the causal process, but that's just kind of abstracted over. We don't, they don't need to worry about that. That's not what's carrying the weight really of the explanation. And so that's another sense in which content attribution is pragmatically motivated. It allows the, the it, it, it displays kind of what's salient or important in this really complex causal process for understanding uh, what's what's going on given the given the theorist ex explanatory goals? That's what allows us to you can carry over uh, the retinal patterns are going to differ from case to case, right? Depends on the size of the fly, how far away it is, and so on. Uh, so what what's important for understanding the explanation is 
the distal, uh, what's going on distally, what's going on in the environment, not what's going on at various other points in the causal chain. But that's a, that's a pragmatic matter. That's what's crucial for kind of understanding the explanation given this explanatory mm -hmm. target. So that's two senses in which content attribution, when there, there are always multiple, there are multiple content candidates and the one that gets selected is going is is determined by various uh, pragmatic considerations. I'd like to dig a bit more into psychological explanation itself, and you you've taught about this. You've taught a course on psychological explanation, and it begins with the the classical role of representation and psychological explanation. And I, I believe that you you cited Fodor and Pilishin on this view, and that's strong representationalism. So what, just what is strong representationalism in this, uh, this uh, subject of psychological explanation? Yeah, so psychological explanation um, has, is, a, is a fairly big topic. I mean, we've been talking about psychological explanation from the beginning and the, where the focus has been uh, scientific psychological explanation, explanation in the psychological sciences. Um, there's also an issue. I mean, we, that's, we also explain and predict each other's behavior uh, in, in, in everyday life and psychological explanation uh, so it's crucial to our to our getting getting around in the world and getting along with other people. Uh, attribution of representation in those two domains, I think, is is quite different. Although there's some there's some commonalities, but I think so. The photo, back to the so pollution was is was concerned primarily with scientific psychological explanation. Fodor's concerned with both. So they're both um, what I call or what's been what other people call strong representationalists in that they endorse the, 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 the thesis that I've been calling robust representational okay. realism. Fodor had, uh, so psychological explanation is explanation in terms of mental representations and computations over mental representations, computational processes that run off mental representations. So um, that was their account, both photo and pollution's accounts of, uh, of what's going on in the brain when, uh, when an organism thinks, acts, and so on. Um, I don't, Fodor also has an account of propositional attitudes. The, um, the, the, the states that get attributed in our, in our everyday lives when we predict and explain what other people are going to do and when we justify our own behavior to others. And that's also sometimes called strong representationalism. It's certainly related to the view that I've been explaining uh, in the cognitive sciences. And the idea there is that propositional attitudes like beliefs and desires are relations to internal sentences. So propositional attitudes are mental representations or relations to mental representations and uh, psychological processes, the sorts of processes that uh, we talk about when we might say why somebody comes to believe something or that we, that we use to explain, say, why somebody ran out of a building. Mary ran out of the building because she uh, believed that it's on fire and, of course, she desires not to, not to be hurt. And the belief and desire interact and they produce the action of leaving the building. Uh, so according to strong representationalism, the belief is a functional relation to an internal sentence and a desire is a different functional relation, all, but also to an internal sentence and they interact in a certain way and they produce behavior. So the key idea here is that propositional attitudes like beliefs, desires, hopes, wishes, wants, fears, intentions, that's the framework that we use to predict and explain uh, behavior in, in, in ordinary life. 
Um, those are, according to the strong representationalist view, those really are re different relations, you have different attitudes, fear that P versus belief that P, That's those would be different computational or functional relations to internal sentences. And that's what the attitudes are. So that's, that's strong representationalism. Uh, so there's clearly, you know, it's clearly uh, a general view about how the mind works, a general view about psychological explanation. To explain psychological processes then would be to attribute to the subject a relation to an internal representation that has a particular meaning. And the inter in, in our common sense explanations, it's going to be the interaction of those that produce behavior. That's kind of the standard. Well, that, yeah, I don't want to say it's the standard view of, of what's happening in common sense, but it's the standard interpretation by philosophers of what's going on when people attribute beliefs and desires to explain each other's behavior. And since you. So heavily committed to these things, representations. And since you mentioned earlier having studied with Pat and Paul Churchland, I take it that this is not the way that they would go about psychological explanation since they're eliminativists about uh, the beliefs and, and these propositional attitudes being in the brain. So how would, how would they explain uh, our behavior uh, if they're not going to endorse the strong re representationalist way of doing it? Yeah, so the Churchlands uh, have repudiated any commitment to uh, to beliefs and desires. They think of they think of uh, beliefs and desires as being theoretical entities, part of a complex theory that we, you know, just ordinary people use in uh, in, in attempting to predict and explain each other's behavior. But they think that that theory is outmoded, false. Uh, problematic in various ways, and it would be better to replace it by more directly by kind of uh, an informed neur uh, neurology. Mm -hmm. So they think that the whole belief desire framework is is a it, it should be scrapped. Is it's it's a theory, but it's a bad theory. Mm -hmm. And you reference a few other challenges beyond. Can I just say one thing while yeah, following please. up on that? The idea that it's a theory, though, is important because it's, Fodor shares that view, too. Fodor just thinks it's a good theory. Mm. So the dispute between rep the realists and the eliminativists is not about whether belief desire framework is a theory. It's about whether it's a good theory or not. You've mentioned, uh, like I said, uh, like I said, uh, a few other challenges to the strong representationalists, and one of them is extended cognition. Is this does this have to do with the uh, Chalmers extended mind? Um. Well, yes. Uh, so, extended cognition theorists think that the mind extends beyond the, the borders of the, of the organism, that it extends out into the world. Um, so, for example, the classic, uh, classic example that Chalmers and Clark use in their, in their famous uh, uh, extended mind paper is a, a patient, I think it's, he's called Otto, who has uh, Alzheimer's disease and has to consult everything that he needs. He, he's, he's written it in a notebook. And uh, has to consult the notebook to answer questions about, for example, where where uh, MoMA is in 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 New York City. Mm -hmm. Compare uh, a, a normal subject, Inga, just has to just consults her memory to find to to remember where uh, where MoMA is. And uh, Clark and Chalmers say are proponents of extend. I mean, there, there, there's a, a range of positions here. But the idea is that this auto, the Alzheimer's patient's mind includes the notebook. So the mind includes his brain and his nerve, central nervous system and also certain parts of the external world. What parts exactly? Well, 
parts that are that needs the the uh, the the notebook is part of the mind and not the coffee cup because it's reliably connected to uh, to Otto's uh, thinking and and his acting in the world. So reliable connections, objects that are reliably connected to our internal processes count as parts of the mind. And the idea then is that. So, okay, so the, the point, so an interesting implication, I hadn't really thought about this too much, but then uh, the contents of Otto's notebook would count not as public representations, although they might mm -hmm. be for Inga, because she can take the notebook and read it, but for Otto, they're going to be mental representations because they're, they're part of his mind, even though they're outside his brain. Mm -hmm. So that's one implication for, uh, for, representation, the notion of representation, it becomes a little bit, uh, it changes our, 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 our notion of what representation, mental representation is going to be. It breaks down the distinction between public representation or external representation and mental representation. And then one of the crucial difference. Now, I think you can see one problem with that. Sorry. sorry no, you can, you can go ahead. get ahead of myself. The problem. Um, what I was going to say was that perceptual scientists, perceptual psychologists typically try to explain uh, our perceptual and cognitive capacities by positing mechanisms, perceptual mechanisms that are engaged in, in the process. And it looks like there's a bit of a, so what sense can we make of a perceptual mechanism for, for auto? It looks like it follows from, it, you know, is Otto engaging his perceptual mechanisms when he looks at the notebook to remind himself of the address? Certainly Inga is the normal subject. Is engaged, is, she's reading what's on the page. It's not clear what to say about Otto because that's part of his mind. So in a sense, he's not perceiving the stuff that's written in the notebook. Um, Inga is, but not Otto. Now they may, in fact, be engaging the same, uh, you know, the same, sim the same or similar processes are going on in their in their visual system. But curiously, for auto, that's not a perceptual process at all. So that looks to me to be an implication of uh, the extended mind view. Is that a problem? Well, it doesn't really seem to jibe with what perceptual psychologists are doing. I think that they would, you know, they definitely treat what's going on in Otto and Inga's early visual system as instances of the same type of perceptual process. It's but it, both are engaging uh, perceptual mechanisms, and that looks like something that the extended mind theorist is, can't say. So that's one worry that I have with the view. Hmm. But on on the highest, I think though that to answer the same point. To, to, just to address your question, the notion of mental representation is going to, you know, has a different character when it's applied, kind of to the to the extended. Mind. Mm -hmm. So on the highest level, at the highest level, the extended mind theorist is going to be referen referencing representations outside of the mind when engaging in psychological explanation that the strong representationalist won't? Um, well, it looks, it, this may be a verbal dispute. Um, they're outside the mind for somebody like Fodor, for a right. non-extended mind right. theorist, but they're inside the mind right. for- Outside the brain. Uh, for an extended <laughs> mind theorist. Uh, yeah, sorry, outside the brain, yeah. but inside the mind. So, I mean, if, it, if this doesn't have any implications for what perceptual scientists are doing, if they're just going to say, I don't care what you extended mind theorists uh, decide as the mind, I'm interested in perceptual processes, and I'm going to treat Otto and Inga the same, then it looks like this may be a purely uh, verbal dispute. I think that, that uh, philosophers probably shouldn't spend too mm. much time on. If it doesn't have implications for how... The, the psychology is going to go and the neuroscience is going to go, then I don't think it really should worry us too much. Hmm.
Well, there were two other challenges that I was less familiar with that you mentioned to the strong representationalist, and they were one, embodied cognition, and two, inactive cognition. What are what are these two theories? So, um, to some extent, these I think there's some overlap between these various e e the- theses: extended, embodied, inactive, and I think there's a I think there's a fourth that's not coming to mind. So the the embodied uh, theorist says that uh, that cognitive processes are are necessarily embodied. So you can't understand them simply by understanding what the brain is doing. Inactive theorists uh, claim that, they typically claim that representation is not going to play any role in our explanation of, of cognition. And they claim, for, there's, they claim further, I think these are two distinct theses, that cognitive systems are to be seen as kind of uh, reacting or uh, the terminology sort of escapes me for the moment, but that the, the, the processes should not be decomposed into that the system should be treated as a whole, as a, a non decomposable uh, unit that, I mean, is made up of uh, parts of parts of the environment and parts of you know, relevant parts of the environment and the brain and the, the central nervous system. But the strategy for understanding cognitive processes should not be to try to decompose them into components uh, that don't cross the organism uh, environment line. So the, the, the mind then on for the inactivist is kind of thoroughly uh, made up of the uh, in, envir- in environment and organism in a way that can, that doesn't immediately sort of decompose into two separate things, hmm. organism and environment. So, um, so inactivists claim that the, that the decom- decomposition strategy is a bad strategy. That's not the way to understand cognitive processes. That's, de- that's doing, uh, doing damage to the, the, the way that the, the, the processes work. They span, cognitive processes span the divide between organism and and, uh, and environment. Mm-hmm. Now, I think this. Do you, do you want? Would, should I say some more about this yeah, notion sure. of decomposition? I, I mean, maybe let me just say what I think that the what are some of the interesting mm-hmm. issues that come out of this. One is um, is what consequences the these various views and activism. Uh, embedded cognition and embodied cognition have for the, uh, for the idea that mental representations play a crucial role in cognition. I think it's not obvious. I mean, I mentioned one of them that, you know, which may be just a verbal point that for auto, the stuff in the, in the note written in the notebook, those are mental representations, but that's kind of putting that aside, which I think is, is really just a verbal point. Um, it's not clear. Um, what to say about whether there's going to be a role for mental representations in their account. And activists, embodied theorists tend to be um, anti-representational. One of their heroes is the, um, the, the roboticist Rodney Brooks, who says that, who, uh, that he was anti, explicitly anti-representationalist and, and claims that he says that the brain can use the world as its own model or sorry, not the brain, but the organism can use this, the system can use the world as its own model. Um, that sounds interesting, but you know, I, I, something we should think first about that is how, how does, how does the organism use the world as its own model? What, what, um, what is the process going to look like? And so I think it's not at all clear that, uh, these various models are not going to end up positing representations. Now, of course, I would understand any representations that are posited in my deflationary framework, that the content is going to be determined by various pragmatic considerations. So I think it's not obvious 
Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of dispute among an activist and embodied theorists. Uh, some tend to be representationalists, others not. So you get kind of a range of views about, uh, about whether such models are going to be committed to representations or not. Rather, whether representations are, are going to be needed to explain cognitive processes. And um, Andy Clark, for example, so Brooks, who's the father of embodied uh, cognition, claims that, uh, and he's a roboticist, so his, his creations can carry out interesting but fairly low-level tasks. And uh, Andy Clark, who's sympathetic to a lot of the embedded and embodied in literature, um, claims that you know, that's fine, but it's not going to, as he puts it, scale up into interesting higher level uh, cognitive processes like the ones that are, that are engaged in, in, in language. And so there's, so there's, there's a lot of range of, of different opinions on whether representations are going to be, turn out to be necessary within these frameworks. So that's one issue of whether representation is going to be necessary, going to turn out to be necessary when you get down to try and explain what, how exactly these systems are working. A second interesting question, I think, concerns this idea of decomposition. So an activist in particular stress, don't decompose, don't, don't decompose the system into, um, into components, some of which are internal and then, and then the environment. And then you know, a, a strategy, a kind of a well-worn strategy for understanding a complex, complex system is to decompose it into components and then explain the activity and capacities of the system in terms of the interaction of the various components. I think that's a, you know, a very general methodology, uh, not just in neuroscience and in psychology, but in understanding complex systems in general, how, how your car works, for example. Um, so the, the claims by an activist that that's not, that, that the system should not be decomposed into organism, elements of the organism and the environment, um, I think is running against that kind of well-worn strategy for explaining how com mm. complex systems work. I, I mean, I can sure, say more about sure. that if you want. I, no, this is all really interesting. Um, so one of the, so John Hoagland in the early, early 90s wrote a, a couple of interesting papers on, on the issue of decomposition. And he said that, uh, so in general, why do we decompose a complex system into, into parts mm -hmm. and then explain its, its behavior in terms of the interaction? We, what, because we're trying to understand right. how it works. Right. We're trying to make the, the complex system intelligible. So one of uh, Hoagland's nice examples is, a, is a, a TV set. So think of it, think of the old TV sets, probably well before your time, not a flat screen TV, but one of those really clunky, thick things. Uh, you're trying to understand how it works. So well-worn strategy is decompose it into components and then understand how each component works and how they yeah. interact. Uh, so one way of decomposing it is to just slice it into cubes. And that's a possible decomposition. You know, just take a saw and slice it, you know, into one inch cubes in each dimension and then figure out how they go back to get, you know, how they, how those components interact. Well, that's a pretty sketchy conception of a component. So a component is supposed to have uh, some integrity. A one inch cube of a, an arbitrary one inch cube of a TV set is not a component of the TV set. The TV set's going to be made up of resistors and various kinds of parts that we un that we understand how they work and we can understand how they fit together. So that's a bad decomposition. That's not going to make the system intelligible. So what would be a good decomposition? Hoagland claimed that a good decomposition, it, a, 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 good, a component should be understood as something that is a, a, a part of the system that's that's yeah. functionally uh, that you can functionally swap out. So you should be able to swap out the components that functional 
category, you should be able to swap out a component with, uh, with a, a different physically realized thing that does the same thing. So that's why we can, you know, uh, your car carburetor breaks down and you can swap out a functional, uh, mm -hmm. functional, a different carburetor, but a functional, functionally equivalent one. So this notion of component is a functionally characterized mm -hmm. idea. And that's, um, that underlies the, uh, the, the, the mechanist uh, claim that really understanding how the mind works requires decomposing it into components, but decomposing it into, not into functional components that are characterized simply by what they do, but it's got to bottom out into decomposing it into neural components. According to the mechanists, and they're running against, this is kind of a view that's opposed to an activism and, and to old style functionalists in general, um, that you've got to bottom out in, in some account of brain mechanisms. Hmm. Anyway, the, the point is that the, the claim by an activist to don't, decomp don't try to decompose the system into organism and environment and then explain in, in terms of their interaction, this notion of decomposition is, is heavily loaded. Hmm. And there's all kinds of interesting issues with respect to that and how, how to understand cognition. You actually have just led us to the last question that I really had, which was, what is the alternative to this mechanist view that you just uh, laid out? And I have in mind, and maybe it's not necessarily a, a, a one or the other, but I have in mind the view that you've attributed to the quote unquote, the new mechanists. Like where does it, <clears throat> where does this differ from what you've just been describing? Okay, um, so there's a number of different kind of uh, theoretical communities here. There's the, there's the inactivists who say, don't, I mean, their religion is don't uh, decomp, don't separate internal components from, from environment. Uh, mm -hmm. Functionalists would propose a decomposition that respects, uh, that understands components as being functional, functional units. So functional units, old, this kind of old style functionalism is a point that, uh, that Putnam made in the sixties that these the components of the, of the mind are, they're, they're multi multiply realizable. Now, the extent of the multiple realizability is up for grabs. In your, if you're fixing your car and you, the, car, the carburetor's shot, then you, you, can, you want to replace it with a carburetor for that particular kind of car. So it's a different one. It's, it's, it's numerically distinct. It may have some different features, but it's, uh, it's, the multiple realizability is fairly constrained. So new mechanists, as, I, as I've said, think that you know, their, their claim is that the components have to bottom out into neural, neural mechanisms. You have to understand how the realization is not, uh, is not, is not irrelevant to understanding how, the, how the, the, the mind is working. So the dispute here between functionalists like Rob Cummins writing important papers in the 70s and early 80s about functional analysis and functional decomposition. And the new mechanists now is the extent to which, uh, one, well, one dispute is the extent to which uh, components of the mind are multiply realizable. And the old style functionalists claim that it does, you don't really have to care about how these components are uh, are realized in the brain. There just has to be a neural realization, but what that particular neural realization is, is, is not really of concern to somebody interested in understanding psychological processes or interested in psychological explanation. Now that can be, you know, that, that view could be, you can parody that view by saying it doesn't really matter. Multiple realization is, multiple realizability is widespread. There's obviously a continuum of positions here. The, the, the so-called new mechanists are concerned to say that uh, they're, they're, they're claiming that you don't have a genuine explanation of a cognitive process unless you can say 
what neural mechanisms instantiate those cognitive mechanisms or psychological mechanisms. All you've got, the way they put it is all you've got is a, is a you have a mechanism sketch, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't approach kind of a genuine explanation of the, of the, uh, of the process or the capacity. What? Now I think that there, I mean, I, I could, sorry, go, go ahead. Oh no, no, you please continue. I think they're overstating it. Yeah. So I was just going to say that, um, I think that one important, uh, that computational explanation characterizes or models psychological processes as mathematical processes. Hmm. And that's, that, that is, so for example, um, many theories of early vision posit, um, smoothing processes to allow the mechanism to the, the visual system to detect edges and to eliminate noise. So, uh, for example, uh, a mechanism in early vision might take as input uh, intensity values at particular points in the retinal image and compute the change of intensity over the image. So that's a mathematical process. And in general, that's a perfectly good example. It's a nice central example of computational explanation. So computational explanation is characterization of a what's, a, what's essentially a causal process in mathematical terms, construing it, modeling it as a, math, as a mathematical process. And I think that that kind of characterization, which is a computational characterization, can be explanatory, short of knowing how that mathematical process is actually realized in the brain. So I think the new, the me new mechanists are wrong about that. I think they've overstated the case in claiming that unless you can say how the how these psychological mechanisms are realized unless you can bottom out the analysis into neural uh neural mechanisms now of course there has to be the process has to it has to be physically neurally realized but what i'm claiming is that this there this computational characterization of a psychological process as a mathematical process can be genuinely explanatory of the process without knowing how it's realized in the brain, prior to knowing how it's realized in the brain. Um, there are important constraints on positing, uh, uh, my, you know, characterizing a psychological process as a computational process. There are behavioral constraints. There are some neural constraints. You can't posit a process that requires an overwhelming amount of computational power that's unlikely that the mechan that the that the brain has. So there are constraints. What are the uh, behavioral constraints? It's not just kind of freewheeling. That's the behavioral constraints are. Um, so let me take a, a a simpler example. You could you could uh, of of some physical system that you discover, you could posit that it it's an adder. So you mm. can to do that is to characterize the inputs and outputs to the system as uh, as representing add-ins and sums. And you could, and then you could just, in order to do that, you've got to be able to, to, to say this physical, when it goes into this physical state, that's representing the number two, and it goes into this physical state, that's representing the number three, and it should go into this other physical, third physical state that represents the number five. So you could come up with, you could observe this thing over, you know, a, a really long period of time and come up with an, an interpretation of the inputs and outputs of this system as, as adding, Consi means consistently interpreting the physical states you know, on the front end as add-ends and the physical state, the, the output as, um, as sums. So, um, and then, and then, now they're physical. So that's in a computational interpretation of the thing. It's an, it, it's, you're characterizing its causal processes as a mathematical process of adding. You could continue to continue to observe and, and maybe it's, maybe, you know, it's going to turn out that given more inputs, it, you, you can't sustain that interpretation of the thing as an adder. So its behavior doesn't, more, more observed behavior fails to conform to the, the computational characterization that you've given with this interpretation. 
So that's a behavioral constraint. It might break down when you know you try doing something different to it, and it does it, it be, the way it behaves doesn't correspond to your interpretation of its behavior as as adding as taking add-ins and producing sums. So that that would be a behavioral constraint just based on op, further observation of the system. So computational characterizations are always subject to those kinds of empirical uh, behavioral constraints. Might be so far, you've got a pretty good mathematical characterization of this thing, but look, when you do this to it, it breaks, that characterization breaks down. So the second point I was going to make uh, is that, so the computational characterization of the process as a mathematical process, modeling it on, ma on mathematical, modeling the causal process as a mathematical process is subject to constraint, you know, behavioral constraints and other sorts of constraints. And the second point is that uh, the it's a hypothesis that the system is computing, uh, that it's an adder, that it's computing addition, always subject to always subject to disconfirmation by further observation. So what, what what does that mean? How does that tie back to the new mechanist claim that they're off that it, genuine explanation requires bottoming in, in, into neural processes? Well. Models, scientific models, computational models, they're always there. They may be offered as explanate as explanations, and they're but they're 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 revisable. They might it might turn out to be not quite addition that it's doing, but something something slightly different, or maybe maybe it's quite different from addition. It's a hypothesis about what the system's actually doing, and it's subject to revision or maybe even um, disconfirmation based on how 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 things work out, how, what further observations uh, bear on it. So the, the whole point of this diatribe was that the new mechanists are, I think, are, uh, are overstating when they say a, a, comp, a model, a, 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 a proposed model of a psychological process to be genuinely explanatory, it better, it better tell us how the, processes that it posits are realized in, in, in neural, neural matter. Hmm. The computational explanation or characterization, let me put it that way, in more neutral terms, um, it's, it's, it's predictive. It's going to predict what the system's going to do uh, given new inputs, given tampering with the you know, input states of the system, it's going to predict what, what the system's going to do. Um, it may or may not com comply with the characterization. And that characterization, so, but prediction, uh, predict, prediction is an explanation. So the new mechanist is going to say, yeah, it's a great predictive device. But to be genuinely explanatory, it has to, it has to, it has to be, explain what the, how these processes are realized in neural stuff. Am I at all on the right track, do you think, in thinking that the Churchlands would be sympathetic to the new mechanist? I think they probably, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, they, they would, would be. be. Okay. I think that, I think they would be. I think that's, I mean, the new mechanists don't say anything about, uh, I mean, to some extent, they're not addressing the questions that, the, that had preoccupied the Churchlands over their careers, but, uh, they're proposing, a, I think, a, a, a picture that the Churchlands would be quite happy with. Well, now, I mean, having even having said that, I haven't I haven't thought about this, but uh, mechanists are not adverse to positing representations and intentional content and all of that. So, there are mechanists. Some mechanists are robust realists about representation, and so further commitments of of mechanists might, uh, the Churchills might not be sympathetic to, to the way that particular mechanist models are, are articulated and okay. developed. I think that, that's another, another issue. But to the idea that uh, genuine explanation of psychological processes is, should posit components that, inter components that, are, that, that are neural components and their interactions, they're, they're, they'd be completely uh, on board with that. Very sympathetic to that idea. Hmm. 
Well, Frankie, this has been, I think, like six months uh, scheduled. Uh, it was a long wait, but it was so worth it. So thanks so much for sitting down and talking all of this. Yeah, through. sorry about that. I just had, had so much going on. <laughs> no problem. So thanks again. Thanks so much for and, doing this uh, with me. Yeah. Uh, th th thanks so much for inviting me. Mm -hmm. It's really been fun. Hold on, Geeslings. Before you go, please uh, like, subscribe, follow if you haven't already smash all those buttons and also if you haven't followed me on uh twitter at robinson Earhart, or if you're not joining me every morning as i eat my pint of ice cream on twitch at robinson Earhart on robinson eats please do so